Hello, and welcome to episode 411 of the official EstablishTheRun.com podcast. My name is Adam Levitan, as always, joined by Evan Silva. We are just four weeks away from playing regular season DFS and betting NFL props. God is good. Evan, how's it going today? Yeah, I've already got uh, corporate setting uh, article deadlines <laughs> and, uh, you know... <laughs> firing it up i mean i just let, let's get let, let's get to it all right let's get to it on today's show we are going to talk rankings and specifically our personal rankings for round three of fantasy drafts aka spots 25 to 36 we actually don't normally do this podcast but we got so much positive reaction to our round one ranking show which was episode 403 if you want to check it out and round two episode 406 so now we're going to do round three we are of course men of the people. I also want to be very clear here. Our rankings we talk about here today, Evan's rankings in his top 150, they're not static. We are changing them all the time based on new information, but not just any new information, information that actually matters. And we take that very, very, very seriously. There is a massive edge in knowing what should move the needle this time of year in terms of position battles and coach speak and news and what doesn't really matter. Before we get into it today, remember this podcast is brought to you by our friends at Underdog. Fantasy, this $2 million to first, $1 million to second place on a $25 buy-in fantasy tournament that's running right now is so ridiculous. If you use promo code ETR when you sign up, they will match your first deposit up to $100. It's really an unbelievable contest and a great way to practice for your home league. So visit Underdog Fantasy and use promo code ETR for up to $100 in free entries. All right, let's get into it here with round three, Evan. And if you guys listen to round one and round two, you know how this goes. We're just going to go back and forth. I will start with my number 25 ranked player, and it is Leonard Fournette. And honestly, I can make a case for Leonard Fournette in round two. I believe Evan had Leonard Fournette in his round two rankings. It's tough to understate how valuable the Bucs running back role is. Last year, Leonard Fournette, six targets per game. That was tied for the most among all running backs in the NFL. And also, we had 25 carries from inside the 10-yard line. That was tied for six most in the league. Everybody should know by now the way we want our running backs to be played past game and around the goal line. And like, it doesn't even have to be Lenny for the Bucs. I mean, remember round one of the playoffs last year against the Eagles, Keyshawn Vaughn and Gio Bernard went absolutely nuclear. Like they combined for 30 carries, 97 rushing yards and two rushing touchdowns. They also caught seven balls. So, you know, I know there's a lot of talk about Rashad White and I, I do like Rashad White. I think there's a chance they take some of the stuff off Lenny's plate in favor of Rashad White. But there's like a free roll almost on Leonard Fournette in round three, because if Rashad White doesn't cut into the workload at all, like Lenny's going to be a top 10 player, you know? And even if Rashad White does cut in a little bit, I don't think you're losing a lot with early early round three, late round two, Leonard Fournette. So that's my number 25 overall player. Lenny, Uncle Lenny, who do you have at 25 overall, Evan? My number 25 overall player is James Conner. No Chase Edmonds. Eno Benjamin, Daryl Williams, and Keontae Ingram currently encompass the rest of the Cardinals' depth chart. The Cardinals showed their commitment to James Conner in the offseason by giving a three-year, $21 million deal with a solid $13.5 million guaranteed. He's got a true three-down skill set. He's got 350 touch upside. He can play in the passing game. I know his touchdown regression is going to hit him. He had like 18 TDs yep. last year. Um, you know, but he can still score, had, like get hit hard by regression, score 10 or 12 and still be really good and pay off his ADP. Um, I'm a little higher on him than ADP actually. Yes. And I get it because, and I get it because there's some hesitance because, you know, he got hurt a lot in, in, in Pittsburgh and actually he got hurt late last year and he's not been, you know, the, um, the epitome of a, of a, of a durable running back in the NFL, but um, he did stay healthy for most of last season. They're getting back Rodney Hudson. They, they look like he, they might lose him at one point. Um, and they're going to be a productive offense because Kyler Murray is their quarterback. So yeah. uh, I think that there's actually, you know, adjusting for the injury risk, a pretty high floor here and a very high upside. And those are the kind of players that we need to be drafting in the second, third, and fourth rounds. Yeah, I should have James Conner a little bit lower than you, but still ahead of ADP. I'll get to him in a minute here. My number 26 overall player might raise some eyebrows. It's Kyle Pitts. Obviously, there's some concerns with Kyle Pitts, namely quarterback play, Marcus Mariota, and maybe some Desmond Ritter down the line. You know, I know this ranking is high. His ADP is like 31st, 32nd overall. But the way I think about Kyle Pitts is the ability to essentially fill my tight end spot with a wide receiver and the number one target 
on his team. It's just so, so, so enticing. You know, note that last year, Kyle Pitts was slot or wide for 523 of his 772 snaps. And as a 20-year-old rookie, 20 years old rookie last year, he caught 68 balls, 1,026 yards, one touchdown. Obviously, the touchdowns will regress positively this year. And the dude's going to get better. I mean, he's still 21. He's just going to keep get, getting better. It's insane. And I know Ben Gretsch made this point on Establish the Edge, but like if Pitts was listed as a wide receiver instead of a tight end, and he had that year as a 20-year-old rookie wide receiver, I mean, people would be at full 3.9 inches to bet on Kyle Pitts upside in year two. And so I, I just want to fill the tight end spot with a wide receiver and hopefully crush people in that spot all year and bet on an ascending player who's the top target in his offense, obviously, along with Drake London. So 26 for me, I know it's high, but I really do like getting Kyle Pitts in round three this year. Evan, who do you have? Makes sense. Who do you have yeah, at 26? Del- Del- Delaney Walker had some nice seasons with uh, Mar- Marcus Mariota in Tennessee, by the way. Yep. Uh, yep. Um, did you have Saquon Barkley in the second round? I believe you I did. did didn't you? Yeah, I did. Yep. I think I'm too low on him, um, especially after talking to uh, Dr. Chow yesterday. He's got like a very high injury. Ra- he had a very low injury rating on Saquon Barkley entering last season. Now he's got a very high one. Um, I talked to Dwayne and, and uh, Ian Harditz on the PFF podcast, and they had me reconsidering yeah. my ranking. I think I need to move him into the second round because Definitely. he's one of the running backs in the league, a very f- small handful of running backs across the league that can play 75, 80% of their snaps, you know, potentially get 280 carries and 70 catches. Mm-hmm. You know, those, those, those landmarks are in play for Saquon Barkley. I think they find the giants finally have a competent offensive line. We just talked to Brandon Thorne. He has their offensive line ranked 23rd in the league. That doesn't sound high. It's not high, but it's better than what they've been over the past several years. The, the, the move from Jason Garrett and Joe judge offense to Brian Dable and Mike Kafka should be exponential yeah. um, and, and benefit everybody within the offense. This is one of the healthiest off seasons of Saquon Barkley's career. He's not coming off any surgery. His top two backups are Matt Breida and Gary Brightwell. And we got people out here pumping up Matt Breida um, just because he's number two on the depth chart behind Saquon Barkley. Yeah. Um, so I think I'm too low on him and he's going to end up in the second round for sure. It's just a matter of time. When I, when I make this change, I think I'm going to probably make it tonight. Man, I mean, you can get in some drafts where Saquon Barkley goes like at the one-two turn. And like, that's really aggressive, but I don't think it's crazy. You can listen to why in the round two podcast when I talked about him. But basically, echoing what Evan said, I mean, the profile of a running back who can actually finish as the number one overall player in fantasy. A lot of these guys can't, but Saquon has the profile at least of someone who can. All right. 27th overall is a guy that I have absolutely zero of this year. His ADP is 16th overall. I have him 27th overall. That is Debo Samuel. Obviously, a few reasons I have a massive fade on Debo. First, I think switching from Jimmy Garoppolo to Trey Lance is not good for Debo. You know, Lance projects to be more vertical. Lance projects to scramble far more, which will reduce pass attempts. And Lance is going to run for some touchdowns around the goal line too, taking away some chances from Debo. I think Debo's game is closer to the line of scrimmage where like he really benefited from Jimmy G's accuracy. Second, what Debo did last year to me is completely unsustainable. His average depth of target was just 8.6 yards. That was 87th among 110 qualifying wide receivers. Despite that, he led the entire NFL in yards per reception at 18.2 yards. He also scored eight rushing touchdowns on just 59 attempts. I mean, there's just no way that's sustainable. And finally, Brandon Ayuk is having a great camp. He's good. We know George Kittle is good. There's major competition here on an extremely, extremely run-heavy team. So I have Debo 27th. His ADP is 16. I'm just completely out uh, on him. Evan, your number 27 player. I get it. I get it. Um, and I, I have him – I have Debo Samuel at the end of the second tier among wide receivers, I think wide receiver 9 or wide receiver 10, and I'm still below ADP on yep. him. So and I, I'm considerably higher on him than you are. Yep. Uh, my number 27 player is DJ Moore. 1,150 yards in three straight – or 1,150 or more yards in three straight seasons has vastly underperformed touchdown expectations. He's never scored more than four TDs in a single year. He just turned 25 in April. And I think that Baker Mayfield provides a level level of quarterback stability for DJ Moore that he has never had before in his career. And I we've talked about this. I think, all, like, at some point, like, DJ Moore is just going to erupt for, like, an 11-touchdown season. And that's going to send him 
into you know being a, a second round value mm-hmm. in drafts. I mean, you, you go back and look at his college career at Maryland, and he was a touchdown scorer in college. So this has just been like a small sample fluke for DJ Moore. And I think touch positive touchdown regression is going to hit him like a ton of bricks and it's going to be glorious. And I like being ahead of ADP on DJ Moore this year. Yeah, I had DJ Moore at 24th overall um, or 23rd overall, something like that. And um, you can listen to the second round pod on that. Also, one note that from Brandon's podcast that you hopefully listened to uh, earlier this week, he likes the improvement from Carolina's offensive line. Certainly not a good offensive line. Right. But he got improved quarterback play to DJ Moore, and he got improved offensive line play. Should help for sure. My number 28 player is AJ Brown. And I've gone back and forth here, man. At first, I was like, man, I don't really want much AJ Brown. But lately, I have warmed to him. And, and honestly, maybe like the camp reports and the best friends narrative, maybe it's getting to me. Um, because of course, I think the Eagles want to be very run heavy, but maybe they won't be. And, and you know, like, of course, I have questions about Brandon Hurts' ability, uh, about Jalen Hurts' ability to be efficient and support A.J. Brown and Devontae Smith and Dallas Goddard. But man, like, raw ability on A.J. Brown and seemingly this really good rapport with Jalen Hurts. I mean, if you follow anyone, Jimmy Kemsky, anyone's found the Eagles, A.J. Brown is sucking up like a zillion targets at Eagles camp. So A.J. Brown averaged 70 receiving yards per game with an extreme run-heavy Titans team. He's still just 25 years old. I just kind of closed my eyes, bet on talent on A.J. Brown. I have him 28th overall, which I think is somewhat in line with ADP. Who do you have? Yeah. 28th, Evan. I like that. I like that. And I think I'm going to move up A.J. Brown on similar pretenses, like just betting on talent. And, I mean, certainly the camp, the extremely positive camp reports help. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, we, we know the dude is an absolute baller. It's just a matter of and, – and, he, and he's balled out before in situations where he didn't have a lot of targets previously. In Tennessee, it's not like Tennessee was throwing the ball aggressively, right. you know. Um, Javante Williams, and my bet is on Javante Williams earning 65 to 70 percent um, of an advantage in the backfield over Melvin Gordon. Uh, Melvin Gordon, it, I think, is is going to return and be a quality veteran, is, is going to be a guy that plays, um, but not quite as much as he did last year. Um, you know, there's a new coaching staff there. He signed for a very, very cheap contract. But everybody in the offense, even if Javante Williams doesn't get to 65 to 70 percent, and let's say he gets 55 to 60 percent instead, everybody in the offense is going to be elevated by Russell Wilson in what I think projects is a very high scoring division. You've got Russell Wilson, Patrick Mahomes, Justin Herbert, Derek Carr, a lot of shootouts, I think, headed for the AFC West. And I think that everybody's going to benefit from just a lot of more. I mean, touchdowns are really st- still truly the lifeblood of what, you know, makes the needle move in fantasy football. And I think there's going to be a lot of points scored in this division. Yeah. The, my, my biggest point on Javante, and I know I talked about him in round two, but my biggest point is that we shouldn't be so focused on how the week one split goes. My question mm-hmm. is, how does the week, how does the split go between Melvin and Javante in November and December? Because uh-huh. that's where all the money is, you know? And so um i'm optimistic like evan is that by that time it'll be 65 60 40 65 35 in favor of javante my number 29 player is michael pittman we we spent a lot of time on michael pittman already on this podcast I recommend everyone check out the matt Harmon pod that we did I, I just think that the upgrade from carson wentz to matt ryan is, is not spectacular but it's solid i mean just from a uh, completion percentage you know at least three points higher i think we can project for matt ryan over Carson Wentz. And I also think it's important to note how hot the Colts ran last year in terms of just leading games. Like they were just winning. Like I know they didn't rack up a ton of wins, but they were winning so much. They were fourth in time of possession. They got so, so, so many run plays off. Jonathan Taylor leads the league in carries. There are paths to a big spike in pass attempts for the Colts this year. And I don't think Alec Pierce and Paris Campbell are like really serious competition. And so I know Evan's super high on Michael Pittman. I like being high as well. I have him 29th overall. Yeah, I have him 29th overall as well. And nice. it's sort of like, you know, like keep it simple, stupid, because he's a young ascending receiver in an offense where he's set up to dominate targets. And it certainly helps that there's a quarterback upgrade from uh, Carson Wentz to Matt Ryan. He plays indoors. As you mentioned, he's got very little uh, target competition. I mean, even at tight end, and look, I kind of, I like Mo, Mo Alley Cox as like a last round pick and, you know, tight end premium. Um, but 
Michael Pittman, his, his target competition is not strong to the extent that they're, you know, they've been talking about maybe bringing back T.Y. Hilton and just it, it, this. It's, it's sort of like don't overthink it. He's a young ascending offense or young ascending wide receiver in a, a very favorable situation from a target standpoint. And, you know, let, let's like let's get this guy on our fantasy teams. Number 30 overall is a guy I think I'm lower on than Evan. Evan had him in round two. My number 30 overall player is Nick Chubb. Um, I would be even more careful here in full PPR. I think in half PPR, though, there's some level of safety in Chubb. Like, it's not really a pick that I like to make because I don't think he's, like, capable of having a truly elite season. Like, he's never going to catch more than 30 or 40 balls, and he's also unlikely to ever hit those Derrick Henry-esque, you know, 300, 350 carry seasons. But he does have outrageous efficiency. I mean, he's one of the best pure runners in the NFL. Brandon Thorne's number three offensive line the Browns have. Like, he's going to get... A thousand rushing yards and eight to ten touchdowns. He'll certainly get that. I just think that there's not a huge ceiling on him. And all this Deshaun Watson stuff is obviously not great for their chances of being in the red zone more. So we'll see how the cream hunt stuff plays out. But for now, I have Nick Chubb 30th overall. And, and if it was full PPR, I'd probably have him even lower right here. I'm thinking a uh, half PPR. Evan? At number yeah, at number yeah. 30. My, my 30th overall pick is, and it's uh, similar uh, to guys that we've talked about, DJ Moore, Michael Pittman, Terry McLaurin is playing with Carson Wentz. And Carson Wentz is, you know, not a, not a great quarterback, but he, I mean, he was good enough to feed Michael Pittman for well over a thousand yards and a bunch of touchdowns last year, 88 catches. Um, so he can support a wide receiver, uh, wide res or at least a, a borderline wide receiver one. And that's where I have Terry McLaurin. He's like wide receiver 12, wide receiver 13, somewhere in that range for me. He averaged over 1,000 yards per year in his first three seasons, despite a quarterback cast of, and these are all the, all the players that Terry McLaurin has caught passes from in his career in the NFL, Dwayne Haskins, Taylor Heineke, Alex Smith, Kyle Allen, Case Keenum, Colt McCoy, Garrett Gilbert, and literally Logan Thomas. Um, so... Carson Wentz is a better quarterback than all those guys. Um, and again, a young ascending receiver without a ton of target competition. They br did bring in Jahan Dotson, but then the the receiver depth chart like falls off a cliff. I mean, you're talking about Deami Brown and Curtis Cam Samuel. Sims yeah. and yeah, Cur uh, well, Curtis Samuel is there, but he's like already hurt. And you know, Alex Erickson. I mean, it's just Terry McLaurin is an absolute baller in a, 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 a low key, nice situation where he's going to be locked into a very heavy target share. He can make plays in the intermediate downfield. I couldn't believe him. I got him in the Apex Expert, Expert League, which is a very receiver-heavy league at the 3.12. Uh, I was I was very excited to get him there. I, I thought that he would definitely go in the mid-third. Yeah, you make great points. And I actually don't have Terry McLaurin in my round three mm -hmm. right now, but I might make a change there i've just been so turned off by the carson Wentz stuff that that maybe yeah. i've gotten too low on it but you make great points that terry mclaurin is going to produce regardless of quarterback he's just a baller for yeah. sure 31st overall and still ahead of adp not as far ahead as evan but still ahead of adp i have james connor um i, I think the reason i probably am not as high as evan is just the rushing efficiency for me is a major concern only 3.7 yards per carry and i just don't think he's like that explosive of a player and he only averaged 2.6 targets per game last year but man i mean you know, like Evan said, he had a really good year. He was really solid. He was so good around the red zone, 18 touchdowns in 15 games. You know, obviously, I don't think we can rely on that again, but just like a solid but not explosive player. So I'm like fine with him. I don't like go out of my way to take him, but I'm like fine with him. And again, I have him 31st overall, which is um, a little bit above ADP. Evan, 31st overall. 31st, Mike Williams. And I think that this is the year that he can absolutely overtake Keenan Allen as the Chargers' number one wide receiver. We've seen the steep decline over the past half decade of Keenan Allen's yards per route run. The Chargers invested a three-year, $60 million deal into Mike Williams, coming off career highs in targets, 129, and receiving. He had uh, almost 1,200 yards receiving. He averaged over 15 yards per reception. He scored nine touchdowns in Joe Lombardi's first season as the Chargers offensive coordinator. And although it bent back a little bit over the course of the season, uh, they did show under Joe Lombardi a willingness to use Mike Williams on higher percentage routes. You know, some of those layup routes that that Matt Harmon has, has discussed. Um, and so I, I like the, you know, the, the increasing diversity of his route tree. 
<clears throat> I have to like his offensive environment with Justin Herbert there and Keenan Allen potentially in decline. And you have to like the, the commitment that they made monetarily. Mm-hmm. I, I think he's a high floor, high upside pick. Yeah, God, I thought about this a lot, man, because my number 32 player is indeed Keenan Allen. I don't even like Keenan Allen that much. I just think that the way they used Mike Williams in the first half of last year, to me, was like awesome, elite. And then in the second half of the year, they stopped giving him some of those layup targets. He kind of returned to a bit of a vertical threat. That scared me. I don't love where I have Keenan Allen and Mike Williams right now, but I do have Keenan 32nd overall. Obviously, the concerns on Keenan are what Evan said. He's been declining, and he really needs a ton of targets to be elite because his dot is so, so, so short. And we have a long history of Keenan Allen not being a touchdown scorer. But, like, he's so good at earning targets when he's out there. 157 targets last year, at least 147 in three straight years. But, you know, there's a lot of competition. Like Evan said, Big Mike is there. Eckler, Palmer, I think, is going to be really good this year. Gerald Everett, I think, is a better threat than Jared Cook. But still, especially in full PPR, like, I think there's some safety in Keenan Allen catching 85, 90, mm-hmm. 95 balls. I pass on him a lot at the two, three turn where he goes. Cause I'm just like, he's not going to kill me. Like Keenan Allen's just not, if I pass right. on Keenan Allen, he's not going to kill me. And so it's kind of a mad ranking, but I do have him 32nd. I think that kind of brings me to a point. Like, I don't know how you feel, Evan, but I feel like this year, the third round is weaker than it's been in the past. Like a lot of years before, I can't wait to pick in the third round this year. Mm-hmm. I'm like, God, you know, I have Keenan Allen. I have James Conner. We'll talk about some other guys who I'm kind of like not that excited about to draft. It just feels to me like the third round is weaker than it's been before and maybe that flows into some of where I have uh some of these guys that I think are maybe just like safer Connor Keenan yeah. whatever I mean I have Keenan Allen at 32 as well okay. um, he's entering his age 30 season yards per route run have dipped in four straight years and remember when we had Pat, Matt Harmon on he said that Keenan Allen is still a good route runner Keenan Allen will be like wake up when he's 75 and still be a good route runner okay but in 2021 he set career lows in success rate versus man and zone coverage and so that, you know, has me questioning, like, th- th- this decline, I think, is probably real. We're looking at his age. We're looking at his yards per route run. We're looking at his success rates. You know, he's still very much propped up by having, like, a, a high-volume role in a, in a high-scoring offense. And that's why he's here. I don't think it's because of his ability anymore. Um, so, and I haven't been getting him either. I, I would take him probably at the at the three four turn, but he usually goes mid to late third yeah. round. I mean, I, I don't think I've drafted him once actually so far this year. Yeah, and I and he I mean he he was going like two three turn early round three for a while there, and I was not getting any of him there uh, either. Thirty third overall, I have Jalen Waddle. I, I don't think you catch one hundred and four balls as a twenty two year old rookie without really being able to ball. And like I have a lot of faith in Mike McDaniel to have a good plan for him and Tyreek Hill. Obviously, we talked about Tyreek Hill in the last episode. You know, get the ball to Waddle short, let get the ball to Tyreek short, and let them do Debo-type things after the catch, yards after catch stuff. And I also think it's important to think about how tight the target tree could be here. We talked about Mike Kosicki a little bit last week. Maybe Kosicki's not a fit in the Mike McDaniel offense. And I know they gave mm-hmm. Cedric Wilson a bunch of money, but I don't think Cedric Wilson is, like, really a threat to earn a lot of targets. And so if everything goes through Tyreek, and Waddle, I think we can find room for both of them to be in the top 33. And that's how I have it. Jalen Waddle at 33 overall. Evan, who do you have at 33? Yeah. I mean, there's a, a you know a bunch of notable names in that Miami depth chart that like, you know, Chase Edmonds and, mm-hmm. and Mike Jasicki and Cedric Wilson, guys that we've dealt with before, but I just think it's going to be so lopsided in favor of Tyreek and Jalen Waddle. Like they're going to get theirs and the other guys are kind of kind of going to be fighting for scraps, although I do like Chase Edmonds to an extent. At 33, I have Travis Etienne, the 25th overall pick in last year's draft, awesome receiver at Clemson, paired with Trevor Lawrence, shower narrative. Mm-hmm. His Liz Frank fracture occurred late last August. The number two back in Jacksonville tore his Achilles, James Robinson tore his Achilles last December 26th. And I, I'm still very skeptical that James Robinson is going to get back his old burst and agility and all that coming off this serious injury. I think that they might be bringing him back just, just because he's going to, he's going to be like able to play snaps, but I don't think he's going to be effective. I think Travis Etienne is going to be much more effective. And I have, you know, MVP futures on Trevor Lawrence and 
if he gets there, I think Travis Etienne would would definitely be a big, 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 big part of that. Oh, yeah. I don't have Travis Etienne in my list. I think in full PPR, maybe I would consider it. I'm a little worried about coming off the Liz Frank and coaches love giving the freaking ball James Robinson. But I agree with you that like, you know, James Robinson is coming back really fast from an Achilles injury if he's able to make it back. I'd love to see a big year from Travis Etienne. I, I really do want to be high on him and maybe I'll move him up as well. 34th overall. I have fake Hollywood himself, the man from Hollywood, Florida, Marquise Brown. I, I know that Marquise Brown had some outrageous drops last year, but I actually thought he had a really good year. 91 catches, over 1,000 yards, six touchdowns. Like, to me, his best NFL season by far. And now the shower narrative is in play big time with Kyler Murray. Their time together in Oklahoma. I mean, Kyler is just so good. You know, before the injury that Kyler had last year, I thought he was like arguably the NFL's MVP. And he was really good as a passer, not just as, a runner. So DeAndre Hopkins has been in the first six games. I think even after DeAndre Hopkins gets back, Marquise Brown is going to be more than fine. DeAndre Hopkins was like scary bad at times last year. So again, an- another pick where I'm not like excited and like to run the card up to the table, but I do think Marquise Brown will be solid. I have him 34th overall. Evan, who do you have at 34? Yeah. Some uh, notable uh, narrative stuff there. Marquise Brown, you know, Drops suck, you know, but um, like you have to create, you generally have to create separation to like get targeted and like commit the drop. I mean, Marquise Brown can obviously get open. And then Kyler Murray, I think, I think that the, uh, the contract thing with um, the, the independent study film study time or whatever, I think that that has affected his ADP a little bit. uh, And which is crazy because dude has gotten better every single year. He's obviously doing something right. Mm-hmm. Maybe he doesn't need to watch as much tape as, you know, the the pocket passers, Mac Jones, you know. How much tape do you think Brett Favre used to watch? Yeah. Okay. Um, and, and a lot of players actually say that playing Madden is good for their, their NFL game. Um, anyways, <laughs> 34, uh, Cortland Sutton. So I talked earlier about Terry McLaurin and how, his, you know, his the the – dreadful list of quarterbacks that he from whom he has caught passes so far in the NFL these are all the quarterbacks from whom Cortland Sutton has caught passes in the NFL Drew Locke Case Keenum Joe Flacco Teddy Bridgewater Jeff Driscoll and Emmanuel Sanders that's it and now he gets Russell Wilson an elite downfield passer Cortland Sutton is a great downfield receiver you remember that ACL MCL tear from September 2020 that obviously affected him even into last season now he's like almost two years removed from that. Uh, apparently he's been riffing with Russ in uh, in training camp practices. Colton Sutton is a guy that I like am starting to uh, aggressively draft after being almost all the way out on him last year. One thing I'd say about Colton Sutton is I kind of get paralyzed with him and Judy. And I, I this happened to me with DK Metcalf and Lockett a lot in DFS and some of the season long. It's like, I don't know who's going to be better. And so I just like, kind of downgrade both. And I think that's a mistake. Like, I really don't want to do that. But sometimes in my head, that's how it happens. I, 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 Cortland Sutton has a major Bible narrative going on with Russ Wilson. And like, man, I mean, Cortland Sutton's a baller. I think Jerry Judy's a baller too, though. I, I'm starting to slightly prefer Cortland Sutton. I don't know. I'm curious where you have Judy uh, compared compared to Sutton. I have Judy like, um, I don't know. You know what? People can subscribe to the website and uh, yeah. go check out Good the top point. 150 and see where it is. How about that? Good point. Because I don't yeah. have it up right now. So that, that's you know, not easy I, out. I honestly had both Sutton and Judy like right on the cusp here. I did not have either of them in the top three rounds, but I really want to get one of them in there. And I think Sutton yeah, is I, probably... I've taken a side with Sutton, but but okay. I've also, I also have Judy to the point where he's very much draftable if you're using the top 150. But I, I've... I've sided with Sutton. I've convinced myself that this is the right right take. Okay. 35th overall, I have Brees Hall. I think if this was five or 10 years ago, Brees Hall would have been a, a top 10, top five pick in the NFL draft. Like 5'11", 217, ran a 4.39 with a 40-inch vertical, had insane production at Iowa State, final 24 college games, over 3,000 rushing yards and 41 rushing touchdowns, also caught... 41 balls. I think this Mekhi Becton injury looks like he's going to miss the year is not great, but the offensive line can still be pretty reasonable and decent. Mm -hmm. They have a lot of talent on offense outside of Zach Wilson. I think there's some Jets bias here why Brees Hall isn't going higher. Um, I think Mm -hmm. there's some bias because he wasn't around one pick in the actual NFL draft. 
and maybe he starts off splitting with Michael Carter, but I could still see Brees Hall being the guy down the stretch. And like these really highly regarded running backs that separate towards the end of the year as rookies are like really valuable and often underdrafted. And so I know I'm above ADP on Brees Hall and the Zach Wilson stuff scares me for sure. He could just be total dust, but man, this is the kind of player that, that I want to bet on. And so uh, Brees Hall for me, number 35. I'm with it. And, you know, it, it sucks about Makai Becton. Yeah. Makai Becton. I mean, because he looks so good as a rookie and he just – it's just – it's hard to play in the NFL at that size. I mean, he's like – he's reached the point of like he's just oversized yeah. almost, you know, and he struggled with his weight and all that. But they they did bring in Dwayne Brown who can still block people um, for a visit. And it looks like they're probably going to end up signing him. Yeah. they They need to sign him. Brand, uh, I was talking to Brandon actually before we recorded the podcast. He said he thought that if they did sign Dwayne Brown, that he would leave the Jets basically where they are in his rankings. In other words, okay. he thinks Dwayne Brown is not a huge downgrade from Makai Becton. So yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah. Nice. Um, I have AJ Brown, 35th, and we've mm-hmm. already discussed. I'm going to move him up. Um, annually among the league leaders in yards per route run, he was number seven in the NFL last year in yards per route run, despite the fact that he battled knee, chest, and hamstring injuries. It cost him four games and parts of several others. And that t- that Titans passing offense just really did not click. Last year, he was still number seven in the NFL in yards for route run. So he's just an efficiency monster. And um, it sounds like from training camp, like they are going to absolutely feed him on, uh, on, a, on a lot of short stuff too. If you remember A.J. Brown in college, he played with D.K. Metcalf. Um, and they had another dude who got a cup of coffee in the NFL. I can't remember his name. Uh, he wasn't drafted, but he he was in a camp for a little bit. But uh, DK Metcalf was the outside receiver, like just really o- only played on one side of the field and just ran like go routes, the, mm-hmm. like the entire game. AJ Brown was actually a slot receiver uh, at at, uh, at uh, Ole Miss, I believe it was, um, and he was an absolute beast um, in the slot and uh, as a run after catch receiver. Um, so I mean, I I love that you know that. Um, that way that they're going to deploy him and, and give him uh, more like high percentage layup stuff uh, because that's going to make it easier on Jalen Hurts and A.J. Brown and and easier on, you know, from an efficiency standpoint, just getting the ball into their playmakers' hands. All right. Last pick for me of the third round, 36th overall, is Josh Allen. And I actually never thought that I would do this. I never thought that I would have a quarterback this high. I've been taking late-round quarterback for, for 20 years. But I think – things are really changing at the landscape of the quarterback position. When everyone was a pocket passer or almost everyone's a pocket passer, no one could really separate too wide. Like I could just stream quarterback and get similar expectation in the right matchup. I could always find a quarterback late in a fantasy draft that would be fine. But it's different now because these rush throwing quarterbacks are separating massively. Like there's no way that Kirk Cousins or Derek Carr or Aaron Rodgers can compete with Josh Allen because Josh Allen is running so much and they're throwing the ball at such a high rate. And, and honestly, like sometimes quarterbacks can have insane efficiency. Like I didn't take any Tom Brady and Aaron Rodgers last year. And obviously they didn't run it all. And they shoved it down my throat because they were like so insanely efficient and, and it buried me. But I don't think that's really something to bet on. And, you know, I'm not that comfortable taking quarterback here at the end of round three, but in a vacuum, I think it's fine. And I also think that given what I said about the state of round three, where it's not that strong, maybe you can make a case that quarterback is okay. Other guys that I thought about here, Evan mentioned some of them, McLaurin, uh, Sutton, Waller, Judy, but I do have Josh Allen, 36 over all. Evan, last pick of the third round for you. <clears throat> oh, man. This is the dusty one. Ezekiel Elliott. Mm. Yeah, I know. Uh, I know. <laughs> no one wants to draft him. I'm in this Apex uh, Experts uh, Writers League, and – I got him in the sixth round. Yeah. No one wants to draft him. No one. Um, even in the boomer drafts like uh, FFPC, you could get him in the fourth round. Um, no problem. And I think he still has 12 to 15 touchdown potential. He did go through this PCL injury last year that, you know, I mean, I, I'm worried. Look, I'm worried that he is turning into like a late career, like devolving into a late career two down grinder and, mm-hmm. a, and a banger between the tackles and Tony Pollard scares the shit out of me. And I love Tony Pollard. And, you know, I, I did the Cowboys they were my first team preview. And like in the, in the team preview, I predicted Tony Pollard is going to take this backfield. 
But now, with how late Ezekiel Elliott is going, I mean, fourth, fifth, sixth round, like, I'm drafting him. I'm taking him. I don't know. What, what do you think? Am I am I crazy here? So, one thing that was encouraging is I thought the offensive line had deteriorated more than mm-hmm. it had in reality. Brandon Thorne talked about how he still has Cowboys offensive line sixth overall. Maybe the PCL stuff is real. I think two down grinders need so much touchdown efficiency. And so you're yeah. betting on Ezekiel Elliott scoring right. 12, 13 touchdowns because I don't think he's going to have explosive rushing games. And I don't think he's going to have explosive pass catching games. They're going to use right. Pollard a ton. Right. So, yeah, I mean, you know, fifth round for sure. Fourth round, maybe you could convince me in certain builds, but mm-hmm. God, I just hate being on the wrong side of a guy who who's mm-hmm. vote clearly in decline. But yeah, man, <sighs> I mean, you're right. No one, no one wants to do it. No one. Yeah, it it, it feels uncomfortable, you know, to sit here and, and say it. But I mean, with how li- how late he's been going, that you can get him as your RB two after getting a great RB one and two great uh, receivers, or you know, Travis Kelsey or something like that, like. Yeah, I, I'm I'm having a, a hard time resisting it, man. I mean, also a lot depends on how good you think the Cowboys are going to be. Because I mean, yeah. I mean, their offense right now is no lock to be like really good. And I do think their defense yeah. is pretty good. But I mean, you know, they've lost yeah. a lot of guys at the wide receiver position. And so if they're not going to be good, that's gonna be a problem for Zeke also from red zone and for more Pollard stuff and come from behind situations. But yeah, he's got a path to a lot of touchdowns for sure. All right. That is going to do it for our round three player by player breakdown that's gonna be the last one we do we're not going to go into round four if you want to see evan's full rankings and our full rankings from the etr composite and by the way just so you guys are clear evan's personal top 150 is personal top 150 everybody on our team is contributing to the top 300 rankings that you see on the site for all the other formats for evan for producer luke i'm adam good luck everybody